The profiler in R is a really handy tool uh, for when you're developing larger programs or, or, or doing really big data analyses. Uh, and and you're basically, essentially you're running R code that's taking a lot of time or longer than you, know, you want to wait. Um, of course, that's all relative depending on kind of what you're working on and maybe some, there are other things that you can do in the, while you're running a program. But if something's taking a long time, um, the profiler is a really handy tool to figure out exactly why uh, it's taking so much time and how to, and, su and to suggest kind of strategies for fixing your problem. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about using the R profiler and, R when, and, and kind of talking about when you might need to use it. Um, there are also some other tools uh, that I'll talk about uh, that'll help you kind of time your programs and time your functions. And, and so the conjunction of, of, of the profiler with these other tools is a really handy toolbox for fi figuring out how to optimize your software. So the first question um, you want to ask yourself is, you know, is, is your code actually running slowly? And sometimes you can solve this problem by just, you know, wait, running your program and then going and doing something else. Uh, but sometimes that's not an option, and you need your program to really run quickly. Um, and so profiling is a general, is a systematic way to examine how much time is being spent uh, in various parts of your program. Um, and it's particularly useful when you're trying to optimize your code, when you're trying to squeeze, you know, a lot of efficiency out of uh, out of some code. Um, and, and a lot of times when you first start writing code. Um, it, it, it runs fine, you know, when you're running it once, uh, and maybe you're, you're writing a small piece of a, of, of a function or a small piece of a larger program, and it looks great when you're running it. It seems to run very quickly when you're doing it. But then sometimes these pieces get embedded in a much larger program, and maybe a larger program is running your piece a thousand times or five thousand times or even ten thousand times. And then your one little piece, uh, which was running great when you were running it, is kind of slowing down everything else because it's being run 10,000 times. And so now you need to make it a lot faster because it's being iterated over a lot. And so it, profiling can come into play when, for example, if you, uh, you have a piece of code that runs great, but then when it gets embedded in a larger piece, um, it starts, it, it, the, the, it, its speed becomes much more noticeable. So... Um, in general, when it comes to optimizing your code, the, the general rule is that you shouldn't do it. Uh, and what I mean by that is that um, you shouldn't think about it at first. Uh, it should, and, and the first thing that you should think, you should think about is, um, uh, is, is kind of how, how to get the code to run, how to make it readable, how to make sure that other people can understand what you're doing. Um, and, because, and one of the reasons is that um, uh, it's often difficult to understand where exactly your program is spending all of its time. And in order for you to speed up your program, you need to be able to know where it's spending its time. And so uh, this can't be done without any kind of, it's difficult to do this, I should say, without any formal performance analysis or profiling. Um, and, um, and so the basic idea is that you should always design your code first and make it so it's understandable. Uh, and, uh, and then after you've got something working, then try to optimize it. Uh, and, and then the famous phrase is, you know, premature optimization is the root of all evil. If you try to optimize first, uh, the chances are that you'll introduce bugs uh, before you even have to get a chance to kind of get things working in the first place. Uh, once you've decided that you want to optimize your code, though, you should, you know, act like a scientist, uh, just like you would in any other context. You should collect some data, right? So if you have a sense uh, of where your program is kind of being bogged down or where it's spending all its time, you should collect the data to figure it out. And the way that you collect the data uh, is by profiling. So the first tool I'm going to talk about is actually not the profiler. Uh, it's a very simple function called system.time in R. And what system.time does is it takes an arbitrary R expression um, and it evaluates that expression uh, and, and then get, tells you the amount of time it took to evaluate that expression. Now this expression could be very simple, like a single function call, or it could be very complicated if it happens to be wrapped in curly braces. So it could be actually a very long expression if you want it to be. So. The basic idea is that you take this expression and it gives you the time in seconds that it was that was needed to execute the expression. Now, if there's an error in you know in the code while the expression is being evaluated, then you'll get the time until the error occurred. Um, now, there's two very important uh, notions of time when you're ex executing an expression on on the computer. Um, the first is called the user time, uh, and this is the amount of time that's charged to the CPU or CPUs. Uh, for this, for running this expression. Okay, so this is the kind of time that the computer experiences, roughly speaking. Uh, the elapsed time is sometimes called the wall clock time, uh, and this is the amount of time that you experience. All right, so the the um, so even though you're the user, uh, you're not the user time. You you experience the elapsed time, 
Uh, and so the two different uh, notions of time can have kind of different importance depending on what uh, you care about. Um, so usually the user time and the elapsed time are relatively close because the amount of time that the computer spends to do using, you know, executing your, your function or your expression is roughly equal to the amount of time that you spend waiting for it, right? Uh, these are for standard kind of computing types of tasks. Um, however, there are times when the elapsed time will be greater than the user time and there will be times when the elapsed time is smaller than the user time. So um, in if you, the elapsed time can be greater than the user time. So that means that you spend uh, kind of more time waiting around than the, the computer actually spent uh, you know, dealing with your code. Um, and, the reason it, and the idea is that the, C, the, the computer may spend a lot of time waiting around for other things to happen, things that are maybe external to the program itself. And so the CPU doesn't actually spend a lot of time working on your code. It may be spending a lot of time working on other things that are going on in the background. Um, if the elapsed time is smaller than the user time, uh, mo this most commonly occurs if your machine uh, has multiple cores or processor uh, and, is ca and is capable of exploiting them. And so, this, so most computers these days have at least two or four uh, cores uh, or multi-core machines. And so this is a very common situation. However, it's not always that the computer, the program that you're running will be able to kind of exploit the use of multiple cores. In particular, R, the basic R program, does not use multiple cores uh, as of yet. However, it often links to libraries that do use multiple cores. And the most uh, common one will be the, a linear algebra type of library. So if you're doing something like regression or a lot, a lot of these prediction routines or, or matrix computations, these all involve uh, linear algebra libraries. And many of these libraries have been optimized uh, to use multiple cores. And so they're, they're called multi-threaded blast libraries or for the basic linear algebra standard libraries, subroutines libraries. Uh, and on the Mac, uh, sometimes called Veclib or Accelerate, there are more general libraries like Atlas for AMD machines, there's AC ACML or ACML, and for Intel machines, there's MKL. Um, there's also parallel processing libraries, for example, the parallel package, which doesn't use, which can use multiple cores, but it can also use multiple computers. And so um, uh, this will lead to, potentially lead to a program that takes um, more user time than it does uh, elapsed time. And I'll give an example of how this will work. So one example of when the elapsed time will be bigger than the user time is if you read something from the web. So here I'm just using the read lines function to read a, a web page. Uh, off, uh, off, off, off a remote server. And you can see that the elapsed time is about 0.4 seconds, but the user time is 0 0.004 seconds. Um, so the CPU actually doesn't spend a lot of time running this code um, because it, the, the chunk of the time is just spent waiting for the network to, we're waiting for the data to kind of go over the network to, and to come back to your computer. Uh, and so the, the waiting for the, the network to kind of deal with the, uh, the data coming, come, going there and coming back is not really part of your program. It's part of a different thing that the computer is doing. And so the, the amount of time executing your program, in this case, just the read lines function, is relatively small. Um, in the second example, this is where the elapsed time is less than the user time. I've created a simple function which creates a, which creates a Hilbert type matrix. And I calculate the singular value decomposition of this ma matrix with the SVD. So the SVD function makes use of the accelerate fr uh, framework uh, on the Mac, um, and, uh, which is a multi-threaded uh, linear algebra library. And so it can take advantage of, of the two different cores uh, that, of this computer that I'm using. And so you can see that the user time was roughly uh, almost double uh, of the elapsed time. So the elapsed time was about 0.7 seconds and the user's time was about 1.6 seconds. And the, and the reason is because the, um, the, the underlying um, li uh, linear algebra library split the computation across the two cores. And so you can think of it as that basically the elapsed time was multiplied times two because it was being executed on two different CPUs. So the amount of time that the user, the CPU, spent working on your program was actually more than the amount of time that you spent waiting for it to come back. Um, you can time longer expressions by just wrapping everything in a, curly, in a set of curly braces. So here, I've got a for loop here that's just generating some random normal variables. Um, and you can wrap that whole thing in, uh, in curly braces and call system time uh, around it. And you can see that here, this is a very simple expression. It's not multi-threaded, there's no network activity. And so the user time and the elapsed time are basically the same. So 
Uh, the system time is a really handy function if you just want to take a, a little bit, a little piece of code, figure out how long it takes to run it, uh, uh, and and kind of and may kind of go through a program, maybe expression by expression or line by line to see which parts are taking a lot of time. Um, now, the part of the problem with system time is that it assumes that you know where to look. Uh, it assumes that you know where the problem is and that you can call system time on a given expression. And so this may be useful for smaller programs, uh, for less complicated programs, where you have a very good sense of kind of where the bottlenecks are. But the question is, you know, what if you don't know where to start? What if you don't know uh, where the problems might be um, and where to start looking? And so you need another uh, function to, to kind of help you along with that.